Greetings and salutations! Welcome to At The Table, and where we talk about TTRPGs, discuss the mechanics, get into the crunchy bits. Before we start, let us introduce ourselves. By my side, as always, is my friend PJ with a new beard? Hi, my name is Pajian. Um, no, no, my name's Ian, uh, and I play Woodward on Edge of Legends uh, here on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. PST. Come check it out. I'm filling in for PJ at the moment because of work stuff that's going on. So for the month of December, you're stuck with me, except last week where it was totally my fault that we didn't have a stream. So I apologize for that as well. Uh, <laughs> you know what? We're not stuck with you. We're gifted with you. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. And anyway, um, in the season of giving and happiness and holidays and joyful fa-la-la-la-la, we are going to be doing some streams that's kind of on brand, as I like to say. Yeah, I think you're with it there. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. We're going to be talking about uh, items archetypes, and we'll do a very dis- special discussion of Naughty or Nice later on this month, but this week we are going to be talking about three archetypes. Uh, Ian, do you want to tell them what they are? Yeah, so the three archetypes that we have uh, that we're talking about today are the Scroll Trickster, the Col- Golem Crafter, and the Talisman Dabbler. Mm-hmm. These are all three really cool classes that do, uh, do a little bit of magic in a different way. Mm. Um, and I shouldn't say a little, actually quite a lot. Uh, but it's just kind of a cool flavor, and it really rounds out a lot of the spell casting that's, uh, that you see here in Pathfinder. Oh, yeah. Um, in ch- hey, Ian, in chat, um, they're saying that your mic is super echoey and low. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, let me figure out how I can fix that. Uh are you able to put your mic a little closer? Well, my mic is attached to ah. my camera. I don't know if that's any better. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you usually use those headphones with the uh, attachment thing. Yeah, I'm, I hope maybe I can quickly find them. Unfortunately, in the middle of my move, uh, hence my box throne that I'm on, <laughs> Um, oh, somebody says it's, oh, Maynard says it's instantly better now. Oh, okay. There we go. There we go. Never mind then. <laughs> Still echoey, but much clearer. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, anyway. There's nothing else in this room. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, worst comes to worst, just lean in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's kick things off with Scroll Trickster. Uh, it's on the, uh, it's in the Advanced Player's Guide of Pathfinder 2nd Edition on page 189 and it's described as magic has been long uh, has long been written down and in myriad forms from the classic rolled parchment to strings tied with a hundred intricate knots from baked clay tablets covered with incisions to bound collections of bamboo strips magic is everywhere you just need to know how to read it uh First of all, it's a second level feat, uh, Scroll Trickster Dedication, Archetype Scroll Trickster. You have to be first trained in Arcana, Nature, Occultism, or Religion, which means it's actually a pretty easy uh, archetype to actually get started in. Yeah, uh, the cool thing about that is that it looks like the prerequisites don't even actually say that you need a... um any sort of magic to start off with. Yeah, uh, so you could definitely be just a non-magical rogue who just knows how to jury-rig a squirrel. Yeah, or a fighter looking for that, you know, little bit of a heads-up in battle. Yeah, I'm just envisioning now a, uh, let's see, a rogue kind of just kind of hitting a squirrel like a TV remote control, like... Yeah, yeah, right here. I've also, I also like the idea of a uh, uh, rogue uh, failing their stealth check due to the wrestling papers covering their body. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, it says, uh, you study scrolls in depth. This might have been a comprehensive education 
informal setting or the sort of education where you somehow obtain a number of squirrels and tr and try not to explode anything you didn't mean to explode. You gain the trick magic item feat and you gain a plus two circumstance bonus to skill checks to s trick scrolls. If you roll a critical failure to trick a magic item that's a scroll, you get a failure instead. Uh, let's really quick just check out the trick magic item feat. Yeah, so I looked into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and overall, it's basically kind of like a general way of saying use magic item. Um, it gives you the ability to kind of convince the magic item that you should be using it all along, or at least coming up with the skills uh, needed to use it, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool because the last episode that I was on, we talked about wands and stuff that had some strict limitations on who could cast them. But with this, technically, you may be able to pick up one of those wands, depending on what uh, yeah. class you're playing. Uh, trick magic item is a level one feat, takes uh, one, one action to use. Once again, you first have to be trained in arcana, nature, occultism, or religion, which you probably already are if you got the dedication. You examine a magic item you normally can use in an effort to fool it and activate it temporarily. For example, this might allow a fighter to cast a spell from a wand, or allow a wizard to cast a spell that's not on the arcane list using a scroll. You must know that activating the item does, or you can't attempt to trick it. Attempt a check using the skill matching the item's magic trend, a tradition or matching a tradition that has a spell on its list. If you're trying to cast a spell from the item, the, rev relevant, sk ah, the relevant skills are Arcana for Arcane, Nature for Primal, Occultism for Occult, Religion for Divine, or any of the four for an item that has a magical trait and not a, traditional tr a tradition trait. The GM determines the DC based on the item's level, uh, possibly adjusted depending on the item or substitution. If you activate a magic item that requires a spell check or spell DC and you don't have the ability to cast spells of the relevant tradition, you use your level as your proficiency bonus and the highest of your intelligence, wisdom, or charisma modifier. If you're a master in the appropriate skill for the item's tradition, you instead use the trained proficiency bonus. And if you're legendary, you instead use the expert bonus, proficiency bonus. So, yeah. So, you're yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really that's a really heavy wordy feat to read all the way through. Yeah, but it's basically they're trying to make sure, which honestly is needed, but they're trying to make sure that you understand. And honestly, because as someone who's run a few games, if my fighter showed up and got a archetype at level two and said, "Hey, I can use scrolls now," I would I would both I'd be like, uh, "Let me read that." And when you read through it, it really does say it. It says it in the second sentence. So um, it's kind of a great way to diversify your fighter, too. Um, and also, if you do have a party made up of a few different people, um, you may have someone who has the primal magic and the divine magic already. Mm -hmm. Why not cast a few of those uh, evocation spells from your fighter? He's already yeah. on the front line. Like I said, I actually really also like the fact that you could be a wizard, and if you have a little bit of religion skill, uh, skill you could cast divine spells from a scroll absolutely yeah so, honestly a heal <laughs> scroll could be super clutch at like just the right moment oh yeah i mean honestly it's it's one of those things where any if you can diversify 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 the more spells you can get on your list the better off you are mm -hmm. i also hey, think about yeah. a uh having a trick up your sleeve as a bard mm -hmm. hey just like wu-tang said Diversify your bonds. There it is. Mm -hmm. so let's uh, so, check out chat really quick. Um, oh, Reap Psyche says, as an accountant, but all papers are talismans. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's kind of interesting. It, I can't wait to get farther into the talisman dabbler which we have coming up at the end to go into a little bit of that, but you are perfect. Yes, you are very right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just picturing now an accountant. Like, I, I need your receipts. Like, wh what's this? You try to write this off? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I like it. Yeah, that would be, be a fun character to play, I think. So, 
the next piece of this guy is at level six basic scroll cache mm. why don't you read yeah. that off for us yeah um it again goes with the archetype scroll trickster um and you need to have this dedication so there's no actual other way to get this feat except through the scroll tri the scroll trickster you have a vast and overflowing collection of scroll scraps, riddled with errors and misspellings and leaking energy like a sieve. With enough care, you can coax these scroll scraps into functioning briefly. At, or each day during your daily preparations, you can create a single temporary scroll containing a first level spell. This spell must be a common spell from the core rule book or another spell you learned via the learn a spell. And it must come from a tradition in which you have the corresponding skill trained. This scroll is unstable, temporary item, and loses its magic the next time you make your daily preparation if you haven't already used it. It can't be used to learn the spell. At eighth level, add a second temporary scroll containing a second level spell. So pretty much that accountant with a bunch of receipts. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's kind of cool, though, because from a GM's perspective, you can kind of hand these little pieces of scrolls as little pieces of loot if your uh, um, scroll trickster is making their way through through any of the ruins or anything like that and slowly piecing them together. Um, it's also really nice because it basically keeps you away from having a needing a magical item on you right at that moment. Uh, a lot of those magical items come with spell storing slots. And if you have just that scroll sitting in your back pocket that you can make every single day out of those scraps of paper, then you basically get a free first level spell. Yeah. Um, actually, like, as a GM, would you rule this? Uh, say you have a magical scroll. You use it up, but you kind of still have the scroll. Would you use? Would you count those as material components? So... I personally think flavor-wise, I would, mm -hmm. um, because it's fun. But it would also be a figuring out, okay, if you have six scrolls, uh, figuring out what the percentages are. So if a scroll is made up of six pieces, then you have to burn through six scrolls, and then through those six scrolls, you have enough components to make one of your first-level spells. Or you could just like, kind of have uh, one scroll, just take them all apart and just like, okay, I'm just going to use four pieces from this scroll and two pieces from this scroll. Yeah, I do have to say the cool thing about it is if you do work it that way, saying that if you don't have the, because it said you must come from a tradition in which you have the corresponding skill train. Um, so any scrolls that you end up having that you're not trained in that area from, you could technically just keep them in your back pocket for a rainy day and rip yeah. them up and just turn them into something you can use later on. Or another way is just honestly go dumpster diving in a wizard's trash. I like it. There's, that, that's, that's definitely the way, the way to go with that. <laughs> yeah, because I kind of always, I kind of want to envision if you're in a city or something with a large population of magic casters and they're always researching and experimenting, they're just going to throw away their trash, so right there, boom, you have your material I, components. I will I will consider that I have succeeded as a GM at one point or another if somebody says, I roll a perception check to check for trash cans <laughs> when they enter a magical realm of any sort. Yep. All right. Our next ability is called Skim Scroll. It's this a is level, cool. Yeah. Level 8 feet. You have to have uh, the scroll trickster dedication first. You can activate the magic of a scroll with a cursory read as you draw it from your belt. You interact to draw forth a scroll. Then use trick magic item on the scroll. So overall, this sets you up for the thing that everybody will want when they play one of these. A bandolier of scrolls. Oh, yeah. You just have them strapped all the way across your chest. And all you can do is pull one out. You unfurl it or do whatever you want. I mean, I personally think a lot of the things that they mentioned in the beginning with these scrolls is like pieces of wood that have the scroll mm -hmm. on them. You can have those. Or like, I see an assassin. Ooh, I've got, the, I've got ideas of a uh, some sort of assassin character with her, with his or her hair pinned up behind them with one of their magic scrolls on it. Oh, that'd be cool. Pull their hair out and boom, can cast it kind of like a wand. Yeah. Um, or... Um... What is it? You're basically Chewbacca. You're Wizard Chewbacca. Yeah. 
it's it's the quick draw. You're always ready. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a really cool feat. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh no, no, it's a really cool feat that I think, in a lot of ways, makes up for. Because scrolls take several actions um, to actually use in game, and it makes it more of a speedy thing. But because it is a level twelve, I believe. Yeah, it's a level twelve. Yeah. This is your mid. This is mid game for you. Oh, this is level Did eight. You? Actually, it's a level eight. Oh, it's a level eight. Oh, yeah. Still, so you're well. You're on the better side of of a uh, um, middle middle of your game. So mid game, you have to be ready for this. The other times, you're going to be dealing with a lot of reading and going, and that's why reading and then casting. And that's why I think it's good to pair this uh, this devotion up or this archetype up with something that can take a few hits. Mm -hmm. um, we got a PJ in chat. Ooh. What's up, PJ? Uh, he says it's like the it's like the paints pants of infinite punching and kicking, but not as accurate to the focus. Yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh, um, it, I think that's. A, is that something that you guys ended up making beforehand? Uh, I not that I not know yet. of. Um, it it sounds like a magical item that will eventually become true. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I love the idea. It's just like you pull up. Oh man, it's kind of also like uh, what do you call it? A inquisitor like. Pulling out a decree like, this, boom, yeah. <laughs> or f you. I, you know what? Now I really want to play. I, I want to run this. I want to run this one down. And if those scrolls can literally be pieces of bamboo, I want to have that Rufus fan. Oh yeah. And all the scrolls are written on the inside of this fan that he carries oh, around. That'd him. be cool. That'd be fun. So it, there's a lot of flavor with these things, you know? And yeah, these, yeah. And it's one of those that will define your character. That's really cool, I personally think, especially for first-time character, first-time yeah. uh, players, because then you're not feeling like you're stuck in some sort of trope. Yeah, like, <laughs> so far right now, this has, this uh, archetype has just the right balance of both flavor and mechanics that I really love. Yeah. And especially because you can step into it without having the magical ability at first. It's yeah. just his goal. And also, it's... Honestly, it's also kind of... What's the word I'm looking for? Um, to the point. You know what you need to do. You don't have to be super fancy about it. It's straight and to the point. Yeah, and if you have those scrolls and you know, because you can take your down, your downtime actions to read through your scrolls and make sure that they're in the right place in the right pocket. If you're a fighter... And you've got a little, you've got a space, you've got your shield up and your sword, and you know that this is the time you drop that sword and pull that scroll out from underneath your shield, off the back of your shield and cast it, you're already on the front line, you know? It's, yeah. it's, it's really cool. All right, uh, why don't you take uh, the next one, Expert Scroll Cache. Great. So, Expert Scroll Cache. Again, um, only a scroll trickster can get this from what it looks like, because you need the basic scroll cache, unless you can pick that up somewhere else. Hold on. Nope, you cannot. Okay. Um, a beautiful sentence right out of the gate. Your scroll collection is more powerful. Um, in addition to your daily scrolls from basic scroll cache, add a scroll with a third level spell at 14th level and add a scroll with a fourth level spell at 16th level. Oh, wait. Nope, excuse me. At 14th level, add a scroll with a fourth level spell. And at 16th level, add a scroll with a fifth level spell. Now we're talking. If you're playing a fighter and you can start putting away those level three, level four, level Ooh, five spells, yeah. and just for the time that you need them, I, I can't tell you how many times on a front line you have your shield or a barbarian, anything like that. Just by the fact that the barbarian can immediately pull out a scroll and say, I cast in large. Uh, would, you, would you say that this works with uh, heightened spell scrolls? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, it does just say scrolls. Yeah. So, well, heightened is metamagic. Yeah. Correct? Uh, yeah, um, well, what if it's just, comes... yeah. What if it's just a heightened spell at a lower level as a fourth level scroll? Oh, fascinating. But you need to burn multiple spell slots mm. to heighten it from that level, correct? So if you're casting yeah. a third level spell that heightens it, you need to cast two third level spell slots. Think it so. burns through multiple yeah. slots. I think that's how that works. Mm -hmm. um, which means that it wouldn't be able to be done with scrolls. But that doesn't mean you can't get a rod or wand of metamagic mm -hmm. and have it in the other hand 
And then you pull out that third level of spell and you use your meta magic wand on the scroll on the other, I think that works, on the scroll on the other hand to then make it a level five fireball. Um, that, that, would be that. that would be super, oh man. I'm just thinking about it right now. Ooh, you, ooh. Uh, we got a PJ saying, yas, make the barb bigger. And yes, also, that's... yeah. Also, note to self, make a shield that can paste a scroll on it for use later, unless that ability has already been stated. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Honestly, it's if you know what, I'm not going to give away who I think we all know uh -huh. may end up having this at some point. Uh, but um, there's a big shield in our game mm. that has a lot of space in behind it that can hold a lot of scrolls. You know what, I'm thinking. Tech so, Morel in Edge of Legends, which is on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. <laughs> Pacific Standard Time here on what, Nat20 what, what, what. Productions. Uh, since Morel is technically our meat shield, can, you, can we just paste <laughs> scrolls on his back and just hide behind him and use this ability? There we go. <laughs> I mean, I, I the thing is, is that having those spells later on, it's just third level and all that stuff, it's nuts. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of those things where you can come across it, especially if it's, say you don't have any, uh... okay, there's four, there's a four different night, primal, and occult. Yeah, say you don't have an occult caster, right? But you find a scroll. Now you have it. It's not like you, you just, you have that scroll. It's not a, and as this, as this scroll user, you can just pull it out in the middle of battle. It's, it really feels like you're kind of making a character as a Swiss army knife at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, our next ability is called Master Scroll Cache, and it's a level 18 feet, and you first have to have the Expert Scroll Cache. Your scroll collection is incredible, brimming with eldritch power, and you could prepare far more than well, far more of them than an ordinary scrolls trickster. In addition, your daily scrolls from the basic and expert scroll cache. Add a single scroll with a 6th level spell. At 20th level, add a scroll with a 7th level spell. Uh, so you're not getting into the Meteor Storm era area of those ninth level, those things that just are world-ending, just cataclysmic. Uh, spells but you are getting the things that definitely are tpks mm -hmm. um now i'm definitely picturing at these higher levels is a anti-magic field it is one of those things of as a fighter being able to cast anti-magic shield and just or a uh, field and just walk up to that wizard yeah just yeah. be able to that scroll out and say you know enter the ring <laughs> it would be oh, so sweet. yeah that that's perfect oh man that's Wait, is a ant? I don't think an anti magic uh, field is mobile, is it? I don't believe so. No, but uh, they do have a radius of 30 feet or something mm -hmm. like that. And I can tell you when you're at the, let's see, yeah, when it's a feet level 18. When you're at level 18, a fighter shouldn't have to have more than a turn inside of that 30 foot bubble with a caster to take them down. Yeah, <laughs> they're playing it correctly. They should be crit fishing with the best of them at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I know that this is a archetype, so you're getting these things, and you kind of have to pick it. But you're already in the multiple attacks. Yeah, and if you've got a fighter with a great sword to keep that other hand open for the spells, there you go. Your, yeah, your your damage will be insane. Um, PJ says Morel is a person with feelings, but also don't forget La Pacific La Pacific Dora. Load that Luchadorfa up and look out. Uh, honestly, if yeah, if she went down this route, ooh, especially with her, she already has that because she's playing that barbarian uh, spirit, spirit barbarian. Spirit. Yeah, that could be really cool, and she could get into some of the stuff where that means she'll have, I think, the occult, right? Yeah, uh, I don't think she has a shield. She uses two-handed weapons. I want to say. Yeah, she but just got that huge axe. Oh, that's true. But having that in her back pocket or on her belt or anything along those lines, yeah. or maybe even in the handle of one of those weapons. Yeah. Um, well, the axe head is pretty broad, so 
I guess you could put a scroll, like, to slap it on the axe head. Yeah, you know, with her, so, uh, when you look at, like, the Aztec and Inca warriors, they have those, um, those skirts of, those skirts that they used to wear that were, like, strips. Yeah, of yeah. Things, like, those grass or something, or palm fronds uh-huh. and things like that, around their ankles and wrists. That would be awesome to include. Spells written on every single one of them. Mm-hmm. She's just got a bracelet full of them. Oh, that would be definitely awesome. Uh, let's see, let's go into chat really quick. Oh, we have Kai in chat. What's up, Kai? She mm-hmm. uh, plays our ranger, uh, Chonabas, on Edge of the Legend. Uh, once again, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time yeah, on the course, Nat course, 20 course, Productions course. official channel. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh, we have a Gospel of Archaeus. I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, ca- says, cast permanency on a giant tile. Carry it around as a fighter. Mobile anti-magic arena. I, I, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm wondering if you could do that same thing with one of our carts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you cast it on the cart. The horse is pulling around. <laughs> uh, it's just kidding. run. Instead of, like, attacking, just run over wizards. Yeah, just, just yeah. Don't, don't, don't think they're going to cast shield right before those horses get them, and uh, it's just not going to work out. Yeah. it's No, seriously. It just turns Edge of Legend into Grand Theft Sorcery. Yeah, it's going it, to, it gets bad pretty quick. Uh, I think, honestly, that's an awesome idea. Uh, it's, yeah, that's the thing, is, with PJ in the chat, there's also going to be a high chance that it's used against us. Yeah. Uh, um, Unfortunately, um, what I see this going with is spells like that. Oh. Speak, speaking of PJ, he posted, nice, ooh, this has given me an interesting idea. Yeah, I just saw that. I'm wondering, Pathfinder 2E enlarge. If this works the way that I think it is, oh, it's one willing creature. Never mind. My yes. idea wasn't going to work. I was I was wondering if you could cast something like that on a pocket trebuchet or something like that. Oh, like yeah, a, yeah. Then just have a war machine because I'm really worried about one of those uh, those anti magic fields showing up on a normal horse. <laughs> part I, of a horse honestly, thing. that's yeah. kind of the reason I built Rufa the way he is. He's a total non magic. Yeah, he. I think, yeah, he's the only person in the entire party that has not a speck of magic on him. Does Shionibus? Okay, okay, him and Shionibus. Yeah, because only ones without is, any magic. Yeah, Shionibus is a ranger rogue, I believe. Yeah. So, yeah, we have, that actually works out because, yeah, cast it on Rufa or Shionibus, have them be your anti-magic uh you know, yeah, and targets. if you did, if you did end up having any of those, uh, any other people in your party that didn't have it, I just think it's one of those, it's one of those spell dedications that you're kind of playing an eldritch knight, you're mm-hmm. kind of playing the bit. the magus that everybody wants to see. Mm-hmm. Um, it it's kind of this weird middle ground where everything's changing, but you're still mostly a fighter, so you're not just stuck with a spell list. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's uh, move on to the next archetype, Golem Crafter. Do you want to take that? Great. Yeah, I can read right off the top. Mm-hmm. Um, this one, again, a massive amount of flavor. Uh, I really kind of wait, I wish we were playing high enough levels for some of our one shots to pull into this. You have replaced a portion of your body with artifice of the kind used to create golems. Fortifying your flesh with unyielding might of magical constructs. Uh, so I'm going to jump straight into the first yeah, feat. Yeah. Um, and it does start at 8, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty high up. Yeah, this is uh, one of the few feats that you can't take until you're pretty high up there. Yeah, and which also, though, in a lot of ways, you can get 7 levels in another class before you dip into this. hmm without missing anything, which is yeah. pretty sweet. Um, Golem Crafter Dedication. Uh, let's see. Ooh. Prerequisites. Expert in Arcana and Crafting, or an ally with expert proficiency in those skills willing to augment you. 
So you don't even need to have them. You just need a close friend, which means you probably could hire someone. Yeah. Or NPC. Yeah. Yes. Your flesh has been specially treated with the same arcane and archemical process used to toughen the skin of flesh golems. Increase your maximum hit points by an amount equal to your level. You gain resistance to physical damage, except adamantine, equal to your number of class feats from the golem crafter archetype. Special. You cannot select another dedication feat until you have gained two other feats from the golem crafter archetype. So it was pretty usual for that. Yeah, you've seen that kind of going around, and I, it's because, and I definitely have been guilty of it, I will not say that I haven't, um, especially with Pathfinder 1E, where I was playing a level 1 fighter, level 1 wizard, level 1 rogue uh, at any given point um, for the feats, and those dedications are definitely needed, need to become a little bit more exactly what they're supposed to be. Yeah, dedication. Like I always view archetypes and uh, stuff like this. It's an investment on your character's future. So it makes sense that your character is going to want to know just more than just one little thing from the archetypes yes. or whatever. Now, the one thing I really like about this is you may have to, you may have to live all the way until level eight where you can pick up this feat. But as a wizard, I would never be upset with all of a sudden gaining increasing my maximum hit points and yeah. such. Uh, that It's slowly taking the squishy off your uh, wizard in the background. Yeah, and also, honestly, having resistance? Who doesn't want that, really? Yeah, it's, and, and adamantine is not super common. It's, yeah. If, if you're going to be fighting anything that's... Uh, it's also a GM thing. Yeah. It'll be a lot of fun to introduce that character with the giant adamantine sword as soon as your player gets cocky. Yeah. Uh, damage resistance. Yeah, or send a uh, send the Pathfinder version of Wolverine after you. Mm hmm That would totally work. Mm. I just see something of uh, some sort of giant they haven't dealt with, or uh, some sort of a. Uh, Actually, that would be a cool. That would be a cool big bad evil, like. Sword, swords and sorcery version of the Wolverine. Yeah, I mean it would totally work. Assa definitely, ass that would be definitely an assassin, I think. Now, the next one uh, that you're going to go over probably has one of the coolest names in the book. <laughs> okay, it's a uh, this one. It's a level ten uh, feat, a cursed clay fist. You first have to uh, have the Golem Crafter dedication and also be an expert in unarm attacks. So, I would say you, you'll be taking this as probably a melee, but I think a spellcaster could be an expert at unarmed attacks at this point, right? Yeah, I mean, by level 10, you'd really have, you may have to work at it and pick up some other feats or something yeah. along the way, but you could work at it. It's definitely one of those, it feels like it's, you're supposed to play a monk. Or a barbarian with this. Yeah. Uh, it says, you have replaced one of your forearms with one made of clay and a f infused with cursed arcane magic. When you make an unarmed strike with your clay fist and hit, your target takes a minus two status penalty to pe uh, saving throws against curse effects for one hour. Special. The damage dice for your clay fist is 1d8 and it loses the agile and finesse trait of a typical fist. So you do get the bonus in damage for the trade-off. Yeah. Um, I still, I'm not upset with this because it's still only one of your hands. Yeah. So if you are playing, if you are able to swing with both, you get that agile finesse with yeah. the other one. I mean, you're yeah. essentially, yeah, you're replacing your hand with a mace, I believe. Yeah, absolutely, or a longsword. Uh, yeah. Honestly, if you're if you're a cleric, or a, even a paladin, with this, that all, that uh, your, yeah, your weapon is built into your body. You cannot be disarmed. When if you're if you're ever a, uh, to uh, throw a pun out there for uh, PJ, you jab with your left and you throw that claymaker with your right. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the uh, that it's awesome. Uh, honestly, I would not be upset with this, especially if you can get that unarmed. Again, a fighter. 
you can, you're expert in these kinds of things. It's yeah. really easy to get there. Why not have this ability? Um, we yeah. have Mainer saying, Full Metal Alchemist. And uh, PJ says, Mega Man build anyone? And continues with 1d8 fist damage plus agile and finesse. Good God. No, actually, PJ, uh, you actually lose the agile and finesse uh, bonus on your unarmed attack. But only on the clay hand. So you yeah. still got your left hand. So if you can strike with both, you're getting your bonuses with the other uh, one. I'm just, I'm just kind of imagining um, your arm is basically kind of like uh, Clayface from Batman. You yeah, just basically yeah. have his arm. I like it. I think uh, one really cool thing is depending on how that works out, ooh, there's a possibility that you may be able to um, have a anybody with nature be able to, depending on what, how your DM allows it, uh, actually change stone or shape stone or wood or clay or ooh. anything like that. You may be able to change the shape of your hand. Yeah. But, Honestly, I'm now thinking of a dynamic duo of a Pathfinder witch because you get because if that person if you hit that person they get negatives to saving against mm -hmm. uh, curses. Yeah. So you have like a ranger or a fighter who got hurt in the woods and a witch saved them but had to replace their right arm with this golem piece that she could mm -hmm. make or they oh, could make. Yeah, yeah. And I now just, you have oh. now I you have this guy clobbering a dude and then the witch in the back hexing that crap out of them yeah and i'm just right now great. also envisioning this is actually a perfect uh if you take this the clay fist uh feet it's perfect for a druid yeah yeah, yeah. Shit, you, uh, honestly as a as a gm i would allow a druid to use their shape earth or metal whatever uh spell to shape that fist or something into like a sword or something and it goes from bludgeoning to now you have a slashing sword weapon for your hand like clayface can definitely because there are uh usually it doesn't get into like later higher level games that certain monsters and enemies have resistance to certain types of attack like slashing piercing and bludgeoning no, it's it's really sweet. It, it's honestly, let me let me go into it. Yeah, I think I think you're right on. Let's see, yeah, if you can shape it, if you've got the ability to shape it, then you can definitely have that Swiss Army knife. Uh, yeah. I would almost wonder if you're, uh, depending on the ruling of the GM, you may be uh, required to have a uh, some sort of cooldown period for something like that. Um, I mean, it is a spell slot for me. Yeah, you're using up a spell slot. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have uh, PJ in chat saying, or a monk of a certain order, the flesh is weak, but the will is strong. Let the stone be the will. Yeah. yeah. And he continues with, I was thinking this is pretty awesome for someone that loses a limb because plot. Get a new character growth and combative options. Definitely yeah, flavor. I, I, totally flavor. Yeah, the, the flavor of it, though. I mean, I personally like it. Uh, PJ was with a... Um, uh, played a game with me where my character lost uh, two of their fingers. Mm -hmm. um, and they were an archer. So they had to rethink the way they worked, um, which was really cool. And I like that kind of stuff. You, I mean, your GM should go over it with you. But if I had a chance and knew this was on the back table and they were like, do you let it crush? Do you let the wall crush your arm? Hmm. hmm. I haven't taken that archetype yet. <laughs> oh, I, could, I could jump into this. Now that I'm thinking with the whole druid ability of shaping weapons and stuff, you could even just turn your hand into a crossbow. You, oh, I I wonder how intricate the objects can be. Because yeah, you, but also you still need uh, yeah. But I was going to say, um, usually druids are also, I'm not super familiar with Pathfinder druids, so you might have to correct me if I'm wrong, but do they have the same limitations as uh, other druids in games where they're limited to the type of weapons they can use? Um, so they do have, 
weapon limitations, but it's not so much limitations, it's just proficiencies. Mm -hmm. The big thing that druids have against them is that they can't use anything with metal. They can't wear metal armor. Uh, that's why dragon hide and things like that and dragon scale armor are so sought after. Um, but you could turn it into anything you have proficiency with, and yeah. crossbows are one of those things. So honestly, with this ability, because I know we'll get off this after a while, because this but this ability is so cool. Now that we're actually thinking about it, your it opens up to your um, druid to any weapon out there that they could they want to use now because a it's part of them, and also technically it's nature made it's nature made or yeah <laughs> yeah definitely and especially if you were a fighter and had the same thing you're proficient you're proficient with everything anyway yeah so just use what you have to all right um our next ability is quicken heartbeat why don't you take that yeah it's another 10 so um you figure out which one works with your character the most um it is once per turn you can use this feature and a prerequisite is the golem crafter dedication. So it's the only way you're going to get it is going through this. You've replaced your heart with one made of animated quicksilver and living adamantine. You reduce your slowed condition by one. Alternatively, if you're not slowed, you are quickened one. During your next turn, you can use your extra action to stride or strike. Dang. So, Dude, who doesn't want an extra action in their yeah, economy? That's the thing I have to think about. Again, playing a fire or a monk. Mm -hmm. You can spend. That's just going to make people mad because every strike you can use a key point on for a stunning fist. Yeah. Oh, man. Now that I'm thinking about, it, about this, the upcoming summoner class. They already – they have four uh, – what was it? They have – Four actions in their economy because of their, uh, why am I, I'm blanking on their name, uh, Arc, Arc, uh, Archelian, 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 yeah, L L L L well, they're, they're, they're pet, they have an extra action for a pet, but now with this, if they take it, they have five actions technically. Yeah, I was actually just looking up level 10. Proficiencies, attack of opportunity. I was looking at what a fighter would already be dealing with at level 10. Oh, uh, Reef Saki, uh, Eidolon. Sorry. Yeah, thank you Eidolon, for that. Eidolon. Go. It's not a it, common it, it, word it, it, in it, the it, English it, vernacular. From, from there on, I'm now calling an Ed Dillion. Um, <laughs> I'm running with it. I got all the letters in there, just <laughs> completely pronounced it incorrectly. Yeah. Um, yeah, these extra actions are nothing to be... And the thing is, is also, you reduce your slowed condition by one in case it happens. Mm -hmm. um, that's also a really cool thing, is having the upper... Uh, some spellcaster thing, they have the upper hand by slowing you down. Yeah. And you're not just quite as slow as the others. Mm -hmm. But quicken, oh, I mean, stride or strike, mm -hmm. if you can run that much farther. Yeah, oh man. Now imagine getting cast haste on yourself with this. Yeah, it's there's it, it will it will get dumb eventually. I do I do have this and I say that with a smile on my face because it definitely means it's something I want to do. Um but it it's one of those things that if you play the right class, you could have up to like six six actions per turn and this being an action economy, I mean, now as a fighter at level 10, you would normally have three attacks if you stand there. Well, now you can run up to somebody and hit them with all three attacks. And then run away. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, or if they're still there, run all the way up to, you know, if they're still there and you don't have to run, now you have four attacks against this guy. Yeah, oh man, and as a fighter, imagine having this, being cast in haste, and having attack of opportunity. Oh, it's just, yeah, no, nobody's going nobody's gonna to walk away clean. This is the, this is the other reason... So now I'm thinking about a fighter, fighters with all three of these archetypes that we're talking about. Because you've got the fighter with the scrolls that's going to cast anti-magic. You've got this guy with the golem arm who now, gets, who now can run up to people that much, get to people that much faster. It's, yeah. It'll oh, get it's back. sick. It's sick. 
Uh, all right, uh, let's uh, let's move on to the next one, is, which is called Legs of Stone. This is Never a skip twelve. Leg day. Huh? Never skip leg day. Never skip leg day. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's a level twelve feat. You have to have the Golem Crafter dedication, and you gain a plus two status bonus to your Fortitude and Reflex DCs against attempts to shove or trip you. You can shove creatures even if you don't have a hand free. When you successfully shove a foe, you can stride away from your opponent instead of towards it, but you must move in the same distance in the opposite direction from where you shoved it. So, it, go ahead. It's cool. I like it, but being a dwarf almost gives you some of these. Yeah. I will say this as somebody who um, actually really likes being kind of that support character that controls the battlefield. I I love using abilities like shove and trip, demoralize, and all that stuff. Going up against somebody with legs of stone will get really annoying. Yeah, no, it definitely it definitely has its advantages. Um, I do like that it says specifically. You can shove creatures even if you don't have a hand free. So now you have, I would assume, some guy giving one gnarly headbutt to somebody, making them fall backwards if need be. I'm just imagining that scene from 300 of uh, Leonidas just, like, kicking the guy into the pit. Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah, that's actually a good point. You don't need a hand free. You could just plant your foot in the middle of their Yeah, side. That honestly, that well, this is one of the things that kind of gets me about uh, some players sometimes. Where as soon as they si see, uh, okay, if your your hands are full, you can't really attack anymore. No, no, you can you can still kick somebody in the shins, and it's gonna really sting. I do, I do like here that it says you can stride away from your opponent instead of towards it. So if you do decide to shove somebody and they are near an edge, uh, i.e., Leonidas style. You're not going over with them. Yeah, yeah. You have a stable base. You have group legs. Yeah. All um, right, uh, let's move on to the next one. Why don't you take that away? Iron Lung. Yeah. The next one is a level 14. Mm -hmm. um, again, you can only get this through the Golden Crafter dedication. Your lungs are infused with the resilience of iron. Treat the result of your save against an inhaled poison as one degree of success better than you rolled. Additionally, you gain the following ability. Exhale poison. Frequency once per hour. Uh, you are within the area of an inhaled poison within the last minute. Ah, you can craft that. Um, you sharply exhale the poison that previously surrounded you in a 15-foot cone. Creatures in the area are affected by the poison. The poison's DC and effects are unchanged. It's cool. You do get a breath attack, um, one way or another. I feel like the beginning of this archetype really came out clean and came out swinging when you get that uh, clay fist. But as you get a little bit higher up, I may dip into it for the cool clay fist and that kind of stuff and then dip back out. Yeah, like honestly, oh, I just thought of, I just thought of a pretty cool tactic. If you're if you have this class and you're a spellcaster class that has access to the spell stinking cloud or something, cast that around yourself, battle it and inhale some of that um, yep. smoke and as when that actually clears up because spells like that, or it gets countered, just breathe it back out, and you have that out again. Yeah, and that's the other thing is you may be able to craft something. Yeah. Um, if you have if you have the ability to craft like an aerosolized poison, you may be able to do that. Like, pick out, pull the pull the cork from a bottle, breathe yeah. in. Kind Alchemist. Of thing. Alchemist. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I was looking it over, and it says uh, at the very beginning you cannot select another dedication feat until you have gained it feats from the golem crafter archetype so then you would get the accursed clay fist which is super cool mm -hmm. and the quickened heartbeat which again quickened one once per turn yeah. if you're not slowed and then i would dip back out yeah that's honestly that's I, all you need unless 
don't know. Your GM is very gracious with homebrew stuff, and you create another. Because I feel that this archetype could use actually a few more feats. There's so much more you could actually do with this. Yeah, I'm actually looking at the stuff that you get. Oh no, you you could it it does pair well with the fighter. I'm not entirely sure. I had the fighter pulled up, yeah. but uh, I'm not entirely sure with the monk how well it pairs at level tens and such. Yeah, because I kind of want to say. Um, if it was my choice, I would have been, like, maybe higher levels. You get an upgraded version of the Cursed Clay Fist, and instead of a Clay Fist, it becomes Steel, Iron, or um, Animatite. Yeah, I, I wouldn't also mind if one of the... Uh, if you started... I mean, they do say with the uh, Fist that you... Um, see, where is it? No, the very beginning, you gain resistance to physical damage equal to the number of class feats from the Golem Crafter Archetype. Grafter. Grafter. Ooh, I've been saying that wrong all along. Golem Grafter Archetype. Uh, I really wish, honestly, I could have traded some of those things out for a little bit more damage resistance. Yeah. But and also... again, for the, for the fighter or something, as a barbarian, it's a really cool flavor thing. And you, I mean, a barbarian, you get quickened. Uh, that's awesome. You get a strike with your fist. Also really cool. But yeah, but the late game stuff is like, meh. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, if you're not playing a heavy combat game, you're playing a heavy RP game, I would want to run this from the beginning to end. Yeah. Just to slowly be replacing parts of my body. Yeah. You're getting into the general Grievous vibe towards the end of that. Your oh, heart's cool. gone. Your, yeah, your arm's gone, your heart's gone, your lungs are gone, your legs could get replaced. I mean, it's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, like, honestly, I would say, like, definitely stuff that I would not probably add if it was my game would homebrewed, maybe have a, like, you could attach a tail to you. Or um, attach extra limbs. Or even wings. Yeah, I, I think you could go pretty far with this. Um, it would kind of it it would if you if your arm was the only thing you got, right? Or some of those other things, it would be really nice to have like a group of something you can pick from per turn, kind of like a key point pool of a uh, monk you would be able to then go, okay, I use one of those points from the pool to turn my fist into a sword, or yeah. this, or that. Oh. Or, or I can use two of my points to then basically cast bark skin yeah. on myself as, like, the, the oh, stone that Ian, I want to over my body. I just thought of something. A alchemist, a mutagen alchemist with this archetype. It could be really cool. Yeah. I, they can have their own little reservoir of, like, ooze. Yeah, I'm, and I'm a huge fan of flavor in all my characters, like the flavor text things. It would be really cool to have that back and forth of, like, a mutagen alchemist who lost his arm. He gets replaced with this, and now every single time he transforms, it hurts because uh -huh. his arm can't transform with him. Yeah. Things like that could be really cool. Uh, I, I just feel like... I'm, I'm dead set on the arm and the heart replacement. Go for it. The thing I'm really amazed by is that you don't actually get, like, a solid poison resistance. Yeah. Which is kind of weird because that's kind of a whole thing about golems is they're resistant to poison. Yeah. Yeah, it says treat the result of your save against the inhaled poison as one degree of success better than when you rolled. That's... Yeah, you get that with a lot of different feats. Again, a, not that difficult. a massive amount of flavor. Yeah. But towards the end, it kind of peters out. All right. All right. Let's uh, move on to the second, uh, our last and third archetype that we're going to talk about today, which is the Talisman Dabbler. The classic idea of magic is that of a hoary wizard pouring over a crumbling book of spells. But magic is so much more than that. It is thought, will, and action, and with the right talismans, you can even make the cut of a sword a deeply magical act. This all hinges 
on the small magical talismans you affix to your gear. You know how to make the use. Uh, you know how to make and use the perfect talismans for any job. Uh, it's a level two dedication, and yeah, you are trained in the use of talismans and sim similar magical paraphernalia. This training might have occurred in a formal classroom or been a amalgamation of folk magic picked up over time. You can craft talismans and know the formula for all common talismans in the core rulebook of your level or lower. You remember talisman formulas and don't need a formula book for them. Additionally, you carry a collection of magical baubles you can turn into temporary talismans. Each Oh, each day during your daily preparations, you can make two talismans with a level, or oh, the item level, no higher than half your level. You must know each talisman's formula. A talisman created this way is a temporary item and loses its magic the next time you make your daily preparations if you haven't already used it. Finally, when you affix a talisman, you can, in any combination, affix or remove up to four talismans in the 10 minute span. Special, you can't select another dedication feat until you have gained two other feats from the Talisman Dabbler archetype. That's a lot. So, of yeah, this Talisman Dabbler is by far my favorite archetype that we're covering today, mm -hmm. only because it brings back the love of those RPGs I was playing growing up in the video game aspects of crafting and your inventory slots and everything else. Having an answer everything even if it's a small leg up of having these baubles and stuff and i just see this weary world traveler you know this fighter who's gone to all stretches of the continents to get that little leg up on another big monster he has to go hunt and he fixes these things to his bow yeah. and his sword and his axe and everything else he has on him it's such it's such cool flavor and honestly the talisman through the magical items i read through them they're really good some uh -huh. of them break you have to like break them to be able to use them because that releases their energy. Mm -hmm. But tied to a weapon or a shield or anything else, I would never be upset with it. Oh, we got a Witherkin in chat. Long time no see. Grab your talismans and no one gets hurt. <laughs> yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's a. Uh, oh, I like what Reap Psyche said. The Witcher vibe. Oh, def yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely Witcher. You're. I just. I don't know. There's something about that. I just see a fighter or maybe even a ranger or something just slowly strapping one of these with yeah. to, to their weapon. Um, you know, she she grabs her broadsword and the, the end of it is just getting replaced with this bobble of some sort with arcane magic surrounding it so her next strike is harder. Actually, do you know what I kind of envision? I envision more of Q from James Bond but in the field. I like it. So yeah, it's it, it could either be super crude or very elegant. Yeah, um, it's like okay, I could do all this if I had my lab and we're actually in a university. But why am I in the wilds with mosquitoes biting me and all these monsters? And I have like ten seconds. All right, fine, screw it. Jury rig, jury rig, jury rig. Yeah, it definitely it it has that uh, uh MacGyver vibe. Oh, yeah, MacGyver. Like, MacGyver, MacGyver, MacGyver as yeah. a talisman. MacGyver is a talisman dabbler. Yeah. PJ, if you're watching still, can we have an NPC who's basically MacGyver, who's a talisman dabbler? Ooh, uh, PJ actually has a question. Can you use a talisman while wielding an anti-magic projection shield? Maybe. We'll, we'll have to go through each of uh, their abilities, but perhaps... Yeah, oh, definitely. Reap Psyche says, Batman with the shark repellent. Yeah, totally. It's, it's one of those things where if you have, you have something for everything. I don't know. I'm also stuck on that anime moment of you've been fighting this thing and your sword's not doing any damage or your bows or arrows or anything's not working. And then you're sitting in the back, and as it gets closer, you're fixing this talisman you found in the back of something, you know, the, the yeah, back of some yeah, warehouse yeah. to your sword and waiting for the right moment. Uh, PJ also could says, this and the Golem Crafter, Iron Man. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wither King says, you see a squire going in for his first fight? Give him all your talisman. Turns out you have the favor of the town hag, which makes you less liked, but you win more. <laughs> so, yeah. 
uh, he also goes, uh, PJ also says, ha ha ha, maybe y'all should check out the Order of the Compass Rose at their HQ sometime. Ooh, yeah. No, I, uh, man, could, could the order, of, the leader of the order be MacGyver? I need awesome. Richard Dean Anderson here. So the next thing, uh, interestingly enough, um, I would like to point out that the next one, uh, Fee comes in at level eight, and then it goes to 14, and then it stops. Mm. So you have a two, four, eight, and 14, which I personally like, because that means you can still get into those level 20, that really high level cool stuff that you may want to dip into with your character and your original class. Um, the next one we're getting into at level four is called the Quick Fix. Again, you can only get this through the Talisman Dabbler dedication. You can attach a talisman using only a bit of glue and some string. You gain the rapid affixture skill feat, even if you don't meet the pre prerequisites. When you use it, you can affix or remove up to four talismans in one minute instead of just one. You gain the ability to affix a talisman as a three action activity from that feat at level 12, regardless of your crafting proficiency. So yeah, now- you're basically, Yeah, you're basically, yeah, MacGyver. Yeah, you're getting into your inventory, you're going through your slots, and you go, oh, you're resist you don't have resistances versus fire damage? Give me a minute. Yeah, yeah. Just take I, I, I got turn. some gum, I got a paper clip, and some string. Give oh, me a minute. It's so cool. I just imagine, like, I don't know, it, it, feels like, it feels like a cool leg up to hand a fighter. They may not be able to battle everything, but they'll always have the leg up to be able to hit that thing a little bit harder if they try Honestly, hard. I would love if to they have this. a talisman. I would actually love to go into this as a ranger, a crossbow ranger. Yep. You know, I can also see it as a rogue. Mm, definitely. Rogue could be really cool. Uh, here's the thing is that I'm, I'm, I feel like this one and the first one, the scroll, could probably be placed over any class and I wouldn't yeah. be upset. Because honestly, if I didn't really care for some of the stuff that druids have, which I do, that's why I play one, mm -hmm. I play Woodward tonight. No, I'm not going to go through it again. Not oh, another player. Woodward? Um, with the MacGyver mullet. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Or having the scroll ability. Yeah, yeah. I'm not I'm not an arcane arcane magic user, but I can use their scroll. And also this is this archetype perfect for definitely perfect for the alchemist. Totally. Yeah. This works, yeah. I think, in tangent with the alchemist so well. It's built for the alchemist perfectly, I think. But uh next one is called Deeper Dabbler. It's a level 8 feat, and you have to have the Talisman Dabbler dedication with some streamlining to your process and a deeper collection of Talisman materials. You make a greater number of Talismans every day. You can create two additional Talismans during your daily preparations. Special, you can select this feat a second time if you are 14th level or higher. Again, it just adds to your tricks. Yeah. So cool. And honestly, if you're a talisman dabbler, you're the you're you're the best friend of your party. Like, oh, you need this? Here you go. I got a present for you. How about a little bit of this? How about this? Yeah. That's you're you're it, Oprah. It you get a talisman. You get a talisman. Everybody gets a talisman. It doesn't say that you have to use them. You can pass them out to your friends. Yeah. Which just again. If you can get a couple of these going and say you have a talisman that'll give somebody some temporary hit points or something, mm -hmm. hand it to you one of your casters. You know, you need mm -hmm. you need a protection here or there, or man, we're all gonna have to be on the front line of this, and unfortunately our bard isn't really coming up in level. Here's a damage increase. And you just kind of start to take those little disadvantages off of your checklist yeah. of what your party can handle. And honestly, yeah, these yeah, these are little talismans are like little bonuses, like little you get a little plus one here, a little plus one there, but in Pathfinder, these little bonuses really add up. Oh. Uh Reef Psyche called them party favors, mm -hmm. which I love. Uh, um yeah. I also like uh, what um, Wither King said a while back. said, just slap the royal adhesive flex steel on it, and you're good to go. On your, uh, in your belt, it'll be the, the ultimate, uh, you just have a bottle of E6000 on you at any given point. Uh, we got Wither King also saying, oh, if you make the breaking talisman, 
with living steel, you could break them and they'll repair themselves. And PJ goes, oh snap, making a consumable crafted with living steel recovers? That solves so many problems. Yeah, I, that, so that's the thing is if you can get them out of living steel, say you're really high level and you're starting to do this, then there's no, if you get to make a couple of these a day, you're just constantly turning. That is, that's a way for your party to make money. Yeah. Sell your extra talismans in town. Yeah. Oh, man. You could be like a charlatan. Like, yeah, it works and everything. You sell them all, all the day you leave, and then it only works for one day? Yeah, right? <laughs> Uh, why don't you take the last, uh, feat here? Tell us yeah, I think we all know where this is going. Um, I think we all know where this has ended up going because this is kind of its only trick in the book, but it just keeps getting better. Um, this is called Talismanic Sage. You have forgotten more about talismans than lesser warriors have ever known. Normally affixing more than one talisman to an item causes the talismans to be suppressed. But when you affix a talisman, you can specially treat one item you're working on, allowing it to have two active talismans at once. This special treatment ends if you use the affix a talisman to treat a new item for this ability. So again, you're just now adding on to it. Is, is the, oh, what is that? Is that Witcher? That, no, 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 I'm thinking of, um, the runes in uh, Shadows of Mordor mm. on your blades. You slowly add the runes across the hill. And when you unlock that second rune in that game, you end up realizing how much power you're missing out, and that's all you ever end up doing is unlocking yeah. everything you can for your sword. This is that feat. Mm, yeah, definitely. Like, honestly, going f just right down the skill tree of Talismatic, the Talisman Dabbler... Every single one of them is really good, and it builds on previous feats. Um, I think this is honestly one of the most uh, uh, mechanically perfect, I want to say, archetypes out there so far. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're onto something with that, because it's also really cool to hand a newer player. Mm -hmm. A player who may not want to get straight into the magic system at first, but if... You can tell them, hey, you want to play a fighter who also has all these magical things that they can affix to their weapons? Yeah. So live it truly. Then all they have to do is learn the talisman book. Yeah. They're not working constantly at learning a spell book or anything like that. And it grows with them, which means they're not, it doesn't feel like they're breaking up their normal character. They can still strike twice. They have the same actions. They're good with mm -hmm. swords and everything else. But they can pick up that talisman that will help get past resistances, things like that. Yeah, and oh, most definitely. And also, for those players who are more experienced, they so many doors are open for them with this uh, archetype, I think. Yeah, it's I that that's the other thing is uh, new players and experienced players alike will like this. It, mm. As soon as I read this, because we were going over this today, and I really started, I was like, oh, that is a next character build. That is something yeah. I could be happy with for the rest, for all 20 levels, is having an ability like mm -hmm. this. Uh, we got uh, PJ saying, solid 10-10 on the Talisman Dabbler. I would love to have this with a bard whose big thing is giving gifts to inspire people. Like Santa with a flute. Oh, I actually really like that. Uh, there's, um, having, the, having that ability, honestly, also gaining money. Mm -hmm. No one's ever going to be upset if you have to sell a few. Um, to some high-priced lord or something along those lines. But uh, going through and kind of being the hometown hero, uh, it's you're going to be, pat especially with the bard, you'll pass out so many buffs, they won't even know who they are anymore by the time yeah. you actually get to the bad guy. Uh, we got Wither King saying, okay, you've helped me finish building my Lashley alchemist. Yeah, Glad to um, help you. Glad to help you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, I like it. I like it with their king. Honestly, this uh, that build is going to be great. So uh, let's let's kind of now go into of these three archetypes we discussed so far. What is your like one, two, and three from okay. what you like for um, you? Let's start with you. 
I'm going to have to go with the Talisman Dabbler at the top. Mm -hmm. I like the abilities. As you gain levels, you can get more gold, which means you can buy more talismans if you want to. It doesn't say you actually have to be the one making them all the time. You can buy two talismans and affix them to your sword. You can buy high-end stuff, lower-end stuff. Um, you can work on them and pass them out to other people. It's an awesome way to also provide buffs. Big fan, 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. My next one would be the Scroll Trickster. Yes. Uh, because that also, you don't have to have magic ability to use the scroll. You can run around as a rogue being able to use scrolls, anything else that you can think of, or even just double down on it and be, you know what? I'm going to play a wizard who also is very good at divine spells. Why not? Through his scrolls. Mm -hmm. And then your last would be uh, Golem Crafter. Yeah, the Golem Crafter is a third. I think it's Flavor-wise, 11 out of 10. Mm. I love it. But I would only take a dip in it if I had to build the character myself. Those All first right. three levels that you dip in, uh -huh. definitely worthwhile. All right. Um, mine is just slightly different from yours. I agree with you when you say that Talisman Dabbler, number one. 10 out of 10. Flavor. And also the mechanics behind it. And honestly, it, it honestly works well with... All the other classes, really. So that, yeah. I definitely agree with you. Um, my next one is actually Golem Grafter, actually, for number two. Okay. Um, I do, while I do agree with you, the later level feats are kind of lacking the Accursed Clay Hand and the Quicksilver Heart more than makes up for it, really. It's a, yeah. it's a two, for me... It's what? It's a three-level dip. It, that dedication, then the clay fist, and then the heart. Yep. And then you just go back and concentrate on the rest of your base class. Or, you know what? That's when you jump into Talisman Dabbler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then finally, uh, the Scroll Trickster. It's kind of basic, but it's still very super useful. I just, I think between the two, between Golem Cra uh, Grafter and Scroll Trickster, the flavor of Golem Grafter kind of won out for me because also I love the idea now of a druid who could just shape his arm into whatever weapon he needs. Yeah, I I do have to say that a lot of that. I do, I do have to agree with you. I think chat actually brought up a good point with the Talisman Dabbler um, Atom Generator. Uh, Talisman Dabbler is not that good if you see what talismans are there for now. But later, when there's more content, it will be awesome. And I think that's a huge point for me, is I would love to be able to hand my player, especially a first-time player or something like that, new talismans, or maybe even part of their quest that they don't even know is expanding the breadth of talismans, figuring out how to craft yeah. new ones, never before seen. That kind of thing would be an amazing gift to hand out to players. And also something that keeps your enemy guessing of never being able to see it before. And I totally agree with you there. I'm, I, one of the reasons why we do this show is we also, as GMs, DMs or whatever you want to call yourself, we love to homebrew. So the limitations on the talismans out there isn't that big, isn't that important because you know what? If it's not in a book, we're just going to make it ourselves. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. Is If you can work out the pluses and minuses of talismans, especially some of those one use ones for your party at the beginning, so what? I mean, at some of those levels you get to cast fireball multiple times per day right yeah. so what if you do get a what if you can break a talisman you get a plus five to hit mm -hmm. exactly uh we got wizard king saying i would love to get the talisman dabbler as a free archetype to really double down on bibs and bobbles build yeah i i, I can't disagree with that because it's only ever gonna get better the more time you spend yeah. in it uh they also go on to say i would definitely take the scroll dedication with that and pj says Free archetype, absolutely. And then Adam Jenner goes, in my opinion, that ranking is Scroll Trickster, Golem Crafter, and Talisman Dabbler, but it will change when there are more Talismans. 
Yeah, I can't disagree with that. Um, I do have to say that going over it, the Skull Trickster, again, is Talisman Dabbler is cool because I have the, mechanically, Skull, the Skull Trickster, without a doubt, is probably the best thing built. Mm -hmm. Only because of the lack of Talisman so far. Yeah. Um, I do, however, agree that there's definitely a part of me who wants to play a fighter who takes Skull Dabbler and then the Talismans as well. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's definitely. No you're you're kind of like in Warham like Warhammer 40k. You just have all these like scrolls just affix it to your it. armor, your shield. Absolutely. I would definitely do that. Yeah. Uh, Adam Jenner goes, also the strong thing about scroll trickster is that the person that has scroll trickster is the one that uses it. Basically, you could give the other spellcasters uh you oh, basically you can give to other spellcasters for basically extra spell slots. Yeah, that's that's the same thing we were talking about when you're going through the wands and rods. Mm -hmm. Is if you want to take some of those extra spells that are kind of needed but not always needed, or things like Tanglefoot or something like that, just throw in the wand. Yeah. Then it's there for you to use, but it's not taking up your spell slots for something that could be doing damage or helping out your party as far as healing or anything like that. Exactly. Or honestly, one of my favorite things, uh, resistance. I love resistance on armor. Yeah, totally. I mean, just there's a lot of options with that one, and also it's easy for a DM to include mm -hmm. because there's so many scrolls already. Any awesome. spell can be a scroll. Oh yeah, there's definitely. no reason. There, it's just anything in the book. Definitely. So so far from what we saw in chat, are you sticking with your list or are you making any changes? I want to make two lists. Um, <laughs> I I and I want to make I want to make two lists in the fact that mechanically speaking, so. Oh, man. It actually gets down to three lists. Only because my favorite is the Dabbler, only because of... I think it's cool to be able to craft something like that, and I love the imagery of affixing it to your blade or bow or anything like that. But I have to make two lists. Mechanically, it goes to the Scroll, uh, the scroll Trickster, the Talisman Dabbler, and then the Golem Grafter. If I had to go to the... Um, Fluff, if I had to put them in fluff order, it would be the Golem Grafter, the Talisman Fixer, or the Talisman Dabbler, and then the uh, Scroll Trickster. Mm. So it would almost be in the opposite order. Only because I feel like, depending on what kind of game you're using, sometimes you can put fluff before actual mechanics. True, you'd be fine. true, true. I think I'm, just, I'm sticking with my list as it is, as is. Uh, let's see. Oh, Wither King says, I want to make talismans for every niche situation now. Yeah, that's, that, that's what definitely getting into the uh, Batman belt territory, the utility yeah. belt. And uh, Adam Generator says, don't underestimate the power of a wizard that can use bless. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, that's, and also, maybe you're relieving people of a duty. Maybe you don't have a cleric. You have a paladin, yep. lay on hands, great. You have a uh, ranger, heal, awesome. But that one extra heal, just in case you need it, divine, yeah. not a problem. When you, when you need uh, that clutch moment. Hey, everybody. But, yeah. Now, that was super fun. We did a lot of uh, things today. We looked into the Squirrel Trickster, the Golem Grafter, and the Talisman Dabbler. But it's that time, and we'll see you again next week. First, Ian. Where do we find you on the interwebs? If you'd like to find me, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter under Bearded Skull. And you can also find me in our Discord. I'm there regularly. Please come hang out. Mm -hmm. And as always, I am Michael Powell. And you can find me all over the interwebs, such as my social media handle. That's Mr. Kapow. That's M-R-K-A-P-A-O or my Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Michael Powell does stuff because I do a lot of stuff, such as my YouTube channel, which is Fantastic Tales of Adventure. And at Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Toyzilla Network, I co-host a toy and nostalgia show called Toyzilla Live. And as always... Uh, we will be back at the table next week at Tuesdays at, what is it, 3.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So until then, we'll see you at the table.
Bye, guys. Bye.